Um, so then without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Sydney, who's going to talk to us um, about her research. And just for her, I brought in the dreaded sugary <laughs> beverage. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. All right, so Sydney, please. Yeah, she would actually send me pictures like, oh, I'm looking at your thesis, and there'd be the Diet Pepsi in the background, so that was, that was fun. Um, so as she just said, we're going to be recording, so I just want to make sure we have everything there and here. Okay, great. So as you saw back there, there are some green bars. Please feel free to eat. And they were tasty. Please feel free to eat more of them. Take the whole pan, you know what I mean? There's also water back right there. <laughs> so, okay, so... Um, Thank you so much for joining us this Friday afternoon to talk about my thesis. I'm excited to tell you guys everything, and I'm going to start with a very brief overview of the literature, the research setting, and the method, and then we'll dive right into the results and their implications. Okay, so starting with Edward Bernays, the modern father of public relations, the key question we've been trying to answer is how do we change behavior? And there was a little bit of a departure from that as the field developed, but there's been a recent calling to return to the roots of public relations, a powerful tool for behavior change. So I wanted to look at this in the context of a branded health campaign, as well as look at the digital initiatives in conjunction with the more traditional ones. And I want to do this from a relationship perspective, which is central to public relations. As I alluded to, uh, there was a time when public relations focused on image building. But then in 1984, Ferguson really pushed for the field to focus on relationship. And as scholars tried to respond to that call, these two paradigms began to form. One setting relationship as an independent variable and then the other setting relationship as a dependent variable. And then in terms of the conceptual definitions, there was confusion there as well, with sometimes definitions being inconsistent, sometimes studies wouldn't have definitions at all. Key and Sean actually reviewed the last few decades of research and found that there was a lot of inconsistency and that studies oftentimes didn't include a definition. So if you look just here between Hahn and Grunig's relationship outcomes, which is looking at relationship as an independent variable, and then Lettingham and Grunig's uh, concepts of relationship, looking at it as a dependent variable, you can already see that there's some similarities. Sometimes they even have the exact same names, despite the fact that they're really looking at relationship in different ways. And then if you also consider that Hahn and Grunig had relationship maintenance strategies, you see even more overlap here. And you can imagine why this was so confusing in the field. So these two uh, paradigms continue to grow and with Key and Hahn in 2007, finding that uh, Hahn's relationship outcomes predicted attitude, which in turn predicted behavioral intent. Then the same scholars renaming Hahn and Grunig's relationship maintenance strategies as relationship cultivation strategies and creating a scale to address that. Now, while that's happening, simultaneously, we see this uh, paradigm of relationship as a dependent variable growing with Luningham and Brunig in multiple studies, looking at it as multidimensional. And then Brunig and Galloway further supporting that it was a multidimensional concept. So Brunig and Lettingham felt that they could design specific strategies tailored to the type of relationship they hoped to impact. In 2006, Sweetser and Kelleher provided further support that relationship was multidimensional with their scale, looking at a communicated commitment and conversational voice. So communicated commitment indicates from the perspective of the public's communication in which members of an organization work to express their commitment to building and maintaining a relationship. And then conversational voice indicates an engaging and natural style of an organization communicating with their target public based on the interactions between individuals in the organization and the public. And what's important here with Sweetser and Kelleher is that they created an abbreviated scale that was specifically designed to look uh, to be used in digital context and they used scales or items rather from multiple public relations uh, studies up until that point that looked at relationship. 
So while all of that crazy land was happening, the world keeps spinning, you guys, and it became more digitized. With the majority of US adults owning cell phones, laptops, social media growing exponentially, with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram having millions of active users, practitioners really had to consider how do we interact with publics in this new digital context? How do we integrate these new tactics with traditional ones? So we see in terms of branding, public relations, and health campaigns and responding to this new digitized era and trying to incorporate relationship with this. So Levy and Garfield said that a brand's essence is transmitted continually via its relationships. And they went on to describe trust as an asset that has to be earned rather than purchased. Copic said that social media is forcing marketers to think differently and react more quickly. Eric, Padman, and Sweetser found that public relations practitioners were proactive in adopting these new uh, digital initiatives and using them in conjunction with more traditional ones. And Kelleher and Miller found that blog readers had, um, had higher conversational voice scores than traditional web page readers. Lee argued that digital technology can help to expand the horizons of medical interaction and Mayer and colleagues found that using an existing social network for health interventions retained more of their participants than creating a network specifically for that intervention. So what we're seeing here is that this new digitized world sparked a relationship-centered perspective across various arenas. It was easier for people to connect with one another, and it shifted the expectations of target publics. Practitioners had to address and foster that human element. I decided to use Rev Your Bev to look at this. As you can see, Dr. Sweetser is revving her Bev. Um, <laughs> so Rev Your Bev is a branded health campaign that targets parents of minors in Virginia, and it aims to raise awareness of the risk associated with sugary sweetened beverages to provide alternatives and to decrease the intake for both the parents and minors. I suggested three models in order to look at this. The first two grounded in the research I discussed and the last proposing a new way to look at relationship as well as correlational hypotheses. So as you can see here, the first was relationship as an independent variable with uh, some moderators here. And then relationship with a dependent variable. Now those we've already looked at and discussed in terms of the research. I also considered that maybe relationship is actually a moderator and that's why we're seeing these um, finding significance in two different ways to study relationship. For my, my first hypothesis, I propose a direct correlation between the OPR, which is the organization public relationship and past interactions as well as a direct correlation between the OPR and behavioral intent. And then a direct correlation between behavioral intent and past interactions. So what did I do in order to try and look at this? So I collected a sample uh, for using Amazon Turk, also known as MTurk, and it only comprised of Virginian adults since the campaign is only in Virginia. They were about in their mid-30s, mostly women, mostly Caucasian, and their income was fairly even, evenly distributed, but more towards the lower end of the income spectrum. I used a survey, so I used Sweetser and Kelleher's relationship measure, and their research looked at relationship as multidimensional. However, my data showed it to be unidimensional in my instance, so that is how I analyzed it and made an index. <coughs> I also had a behavioral intent uh, measure for oneself. So I intend to drink sugary sweetened beverages versus I intend not to drink sugary sweetened beverages with a higher number indicating the behavior we want, which is to not drink sugary sweetened beverages. Our sweets are, hasn't quite gotten that, but that's the idea. Uh, so, and then also one for- Big sugar doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so also one for uh, someone's kid. So, 
do you intend to provide these beverages to your child? And then lastly, an attitude measure with a higher number indicating more positive and more positive attitude towards Rev Your Bev. I also asked past interactions, so I had yes or no measures, have you been to an event, as well as the number of interactions, so how many times have you liked one of Rev Your Bev's posts? I also asked knowledge questions about Rev Your Bev that were yes or no. And I asked their beverage intake, so how many diet sodas have you drank? Or how many um, ounces of water did you drink? And this was based on the day before they took the survey. And then I also asked demographics. So age, gender, income, ethnicity. All right, guys, let's get to the fun stuff. So uh, I found that this sample actually had fairly healthy drinking habits with water being the beverage they consume primarily or the, the most. And then I also saw that they had low behavioral intent scores for themselves, moderate ones for their children. Low awareness of the brand and limited knowledge of what Rev Your Bev does, but what's interesting is we saw high attitude scores and moderate relationship scores for this sample. And we'll talk a little more about that. So with the models, um, there was not significance for the initial zero order correlation, so I was not able to test my beautiful models. And this may be because of the low awareness issue that we had with this sample. So future um, research would really want to try and, and address that. For my first hypothesis that proposed a correlation between the OPR and the and past interactions, there is partially supported. Now, I want to start with explaining why you're seeing a negative correlation here. Originally, I intended to use the ratio data with the number of times you had liked to post or gone to an event. But because I didn't find significance there, I used the yes or no data with no being a higher number. So uh, Rep Your Bev recently scaled back its events, which may be why we're not seeing anyone reporting attending events. And when they did have events, about 40 people would come. So that may be why we're seeing that here. And then with Facebook, that's a very low sample size. So really want to, and then the correlation values as well are a little on the low end. So you really want to look at this as a trend rather than really strong support for hypothesis one. For hypothesis two, we were not able to find support. There was a direct correlation between the OPR and behavioral intent for one's self or for their child. And then for hypothesis three, we were able to find it was moderately supported. And again, I want to point out with the situation with that negative value so that um, you're understanding that because no was a higher number than yes in terms of if you had been to an event the website or follow the Facebook page. So it's interesting that we're seeing this with the website because Rev Your Bev recently created a very dynamic uh, website experience where you could go in, you could say what you're drinking and the little sugar meter would fill up and then they provide alternatives like, well, maybe have your tea unsweetened and then it would like fade away. So they've really been pushing that and that may be uh, why we're seeing some more findings with the website. Also with this age group, they're um, a little, Bit older with their mid-30s and so that may be why Facebook wasn't as central for them. In addition to looking at the uh, predictions that I proposed, I also looked at supplementary analysis. For the first four bullets here I ran a bivariate correlation and then for the last one I ran a linear regression analysis. As you can see here there was a negative correlation between behavioral intent for oneself and sugary sweetened beverage intake, as well as one for their child. So what we're seeing here is um, that what you're saying you're gonna do is kind of matching up with what you actually did recently. And then there was also a direct correlation between behavioral intent for oneself and behavioral intent for one's child. Now this is really strong, or I'd say um, this is moderate, leaning towards strong here, and you can see that the, there are higher significant values here too. So what's interesting here is that parents may actually <coughs> decrease the sugary beverages they're providing to their children as it decreases for themselves. Of course, we need more research because we can't say causation here, but the research is pointing to that as a possibility. 
We also saw that there was a direct correlation between relationship and attitude, which makes sense when you see the last finding with uh, the prediction that attitude predicts relationship. So attitude may actually be an antecedent between behavior and relationship, and this is actually in conflict with previous research by Kian Han in 2007 that said relationship outcomes predict attitude, which pr predict behavioral intent. To look at differences between groups, I conducted t-tests. And I found that when you compared website visitors against those who had not visited the website, they had higher relationship and attitude scores, as well as higher behavioral intent scores towards one's child. I did a similar thing for our Facebook followers and found that those who followed the Facebook page had higher relationship scores. Again, you want to consider this was a small sample size, so we want to keep that in mind, but we were able to find significance here. And then I compared women and men, finding that women had higher relationship scores and higher attitude scores. So this is really interesting because two thirds of women handle most of the shopping and there may be an opportunity to target women in order to decrease the sugary beverage intake in their families. Basically mothers may be the key and if you're a mother, I'm sure you would agree with that. Okay, so let's discuss this a little bit further. What we saw in this study was low awareness scores and low sugary sweetened beverage intake. So this is kind of interesting. Um, Regrubev has been in market for a number of years now. And so that we're still seeing that low sugary sweetened beverage intake despite low awareness of the brand. What may be happening is that the messaging itself is resonating and affecting behavior without the target actually associating the brand with the messaging. So the brand may be able to affect behavior even if respondents don't consciously remember it. And then when you look at that, we found moderate relationship and high attitude scores despite that low awareness. And you consider uh, the brand asset evaluator, which is looking at brand equity on four characteristics, which is differentiation, relevance, esteem, and knowledge. You'd probably think that, okay, Gregor Bear probably doesn't have the highest brand equity. And then if you also think about Halt's argument that what makes branding so powerful is the nature of a brand's perceptions, that it's really about those conversations and those stories that are being told day to day about a brand. It's, it's an interesting finding because it kind of conflicts with that. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kalika. Wow, me, Barry. <laughs> no one's moving. Right now. Riveting, riveting. You need to dance a little. <laughs> Um, oh, they're going to see that on the recording for them. Okay. Um, so, um, what we may be seeing here is that someone could actually interact with the brand, fail to recognize the brand, and still hold their perceptions of the brand, which is in conflict with previous branding research. It's like brand awareness is where you start. So, this is an interesting finding here. And additional research can hope, hopefully start to figure out what's going on there. Lastly, with visiting the website, that had more of an impact on relationship and attitude than behavioral intent. And this supports previous research that says behavior change or relationship is cultivated online, but it kind of conflicts with previous research that argues social is prime, a primary source of communication between organizations and public, and that it's an integral part of many people's lives. So when we look at some of the limitations of this study, which I've listed here for you, first starting with Amazon Turk, anytime that you use a sample that's collected on a platform like Amazon Turk, there's always the potential that there is something specific about those individuals that you're not seeing and that is affecting the results that you're getting. So using other recruitment methods and future research can help to address that. Increasing sample size is almost always a good thing in research, as we all know. Uh, and so that can probably help to address several of the things listed here. And then looking at the collinearity, uh, I did find collinearity between attitude and relationship. So that, what we could do to kind of address that is future studies that use both of these scales see, okay, is this happening over and over again, or was this just with this particular study? 
In a perfect world, what would really help is to do a longitudinal study from the launch of a brand and health campaign through the relationship building process, and then actually seeing is there behavior change. And that can really help to answer the question we were trying to look at with the models of where is relationship lie in this? Is it an independent variable? Is it a dependent variable? Is it a moderator? Come on in. <laughs> so in conclusion, what we are able to do is that using the relationship perspective for a branded health campaign showed some support. You know, public relations practitioners and branding experts are really good at being able to build relationships between an organization and its target public. And so we've seen some support for doing that here and future research should continue to look in that area so we can better guide health campaigns. In terms of the divide between how relationship should be studied, that continues. And there are scholars really calling out for clarity and consistency here. And that is something that still needs to be answered. Thank you so much. <laughs>